everyone. Welcome to another episode of Earth is Our Witness. My name is Parimal. I'm the producer and host. And like always, we have a really, really special guest. In fact, not one, but two special guests today. Uh, today's topic is very interesting, and I'll tell you why for a few reasons. One, it's about my home country, India. I mean, who doesn't like India? Number two, it's about sports, but not just any sports, cricket. For people who don't know cricket, it's absolutely phenomenal sport. It's played all around the world. Uh, my friends who play baseball, I tell them it's professional baseball. It's the way I tell them. It's cricket. And, uh, and today's guest is... Um, is a really interesting guest. I'll tell you why I'm a huge fan because he is an Australian test captain, former test captain, and a cricket legend all around the world, turned photographer now. And just a while back, I was browsing on YouTube and I came across this beautiful photography. Uh, it was called The Spirit of Cricket India. And it was from a gentleman called Steve Waugh. And I said, is that the same Steve Waugh, the cricketer legend Steve Waugh? And he's doing cricket and turns out he is. So he's son, a photographer. And just beautiful images from all around, um, you know, India, cricket, you know, being played on the streets of uh, Juhu, Mumbai, to, you know, the monks in the Ramshala, to uh, slums, to just what have you. And, and I just, I was mesmerized with the photos and the stories. And then I called my a good friend, Richard Ionson, who we all know has been on Earth as a Witness show twice now. Richard Ionson is a Lonely Planet guy to travel photography and actually is a mutual friend between Steve and I. And uh, I said, Richard, what do you think about bringing Steve on? And Richard, make the magic happen. So with that, I want to welcome you all. I want to welcome Richard um, and uh, welcome much. Steve. Uh, but you. Welcome to both of you. It's such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Nice, nice to be here. Thank you for the invite. Very nice. So let me, let me ask you this. Uh, before we get started about the spirit of cricket in India, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But before that, how did you guys meet? Uh, we, we met a few years ago. Steve was a Canon ambassador and I'm a mm -hmm. Canon master. And uh, there was a period where they did quite a few events in a row and we both got involved in an event called uh, Shine, which was using photography for, you know, good purposes to shine a light on things that we thought were important. So that's how we met. It was, I'm not, I'm not sure how many years ago, quite a few yeah, years yeah, ago. Correct. Yep, um, correct. That was uh, probably over a decade ago. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. You were the master, and I was sort of I was learning about photography. <laughs> well, you, yes, you were the celebrity ambassador. Um, yes. Steve, Steve even came to one of my um, one day workshops. Wow. Yes, that's right. I did. I, I needed more than one day, though. It was, it was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, learning it was a good learning experience, and um, yeah, I think. Um, Photography for me it was just a hobby uh, back when I was playing cricket. And the last few years I wanted to take it more seriously. So to get better, you need to learn off uh, people that are much better than you. And that's why I was um, spent the day with Richard. Well, you say that, Steve. And, and I mean, this book that, that we is the topic of today's discussion is yep. is huge, but it's not your first foray because I remember being given a book for a mm. birthday, um, and it was one of the Ashes Diaries. And that was yes. a photographic book. Yeah, well, it's sort of my first serious photographic book. I've done actually, four, this is my 14th book. Um, I did a lot of tour diaries when I was playing. So I always enjoyed writing and I tried to take my own photographs. Um, I did have another book called Images of War, which was um, my first go at a photography book. And that was sort of a collection of photos that I'd taken over the years because I probably had taken five to 10,000 photos during my cricket career most of which were really bad because I was a photographer that just just take a million photographs, so I hope the best, put it on the automatic setting and away you go. So um, that was my mode of photography, like most people. Um, the more you take, the better chance you've got of getting a good one. Um, but for this book, I wanted to take a, a totally different approach. So um, I enlisted the help of a good mate of mine called Trent Park, who's a mutual friend of ours, also an ex-cricketer, um, the only Australian photographer ever to be invited to the Magnum Photo Agency in France. And... Um, He's um, you know, a tremendous teacher and I just tried to soak up every minute. We had 18 days together and I sort of um, Velcroed myself to him for the first couple of days to make sure I could learn as much as I could. And then the last week or so, I was sort of um, out there doing it by myself. I think you're underselling yourself a little bit because uh -huh. I do remember that. But what I remember was it, it was the Ashes Diary. I think it was the Ashes Diary. It was yeah. heavily photographic. I think it was black and white. And I say you're underselling yourself because I suspect you had way more important things on your mind than actually mm. taking the pictures. But because you had that um, access, obviously, to yeah. the, the team and the dressing room behind the scenes, oh. 
you yeah. did produce some pretty interesting work back then. Yeah, it was a big advantage, obviously, being behind the scenes. And I, I sort of didn't realise how much people wanted to know actually what went on behind closed doors with the touring side. I guess, um, you know, my diaries, a lot of stuff I wrote in those diaries each day, I thought, well, that's not very interesting. But then someone would buy the book and say, that was a fantastic story. I didn't know that about that sort of person. I didn't know that's the way you prepared. So people find those little bits of um, information really interesting. I suppose it's the same with those photographs, taking a photograph um for example, in the Lord's change room um, during a rain delay and you see guys playing cards and other guys yeah. doing waves, some guys listening to music. And for me, that was an everyday occurrence. But when you take a photo of it, people find it fascinating. So yeah, you've got a big advantage being um, inside the change room or on the team bus with the guys. But the, these things also, I mean, that, photography is a lifetime journey, you know, for most of us. We're, we're yeah. always getting better no matter how long we've been in the game. And I have no sure. doubt that, that early work set you in good stead for you know this amount yeah, of well, effort now. yeah well i think i have an eye to take a good photo i can see what um is interesting because i'm interested in a lot of things so i think um then you do take interesting photos but for me the challenge was to elevate myself as a photographer to get the framing right to get the light right to get the shutter speed you know the aperture um iso all those things which i'd heard about but i didn't know what they were it was like all these um photographic <laughs> terms and I thought what are they talking about so this was the first time I really got that and every photo I took um, over 17 days was about 18,000 photographs was taken on the, on the manual setting which is something I'd never done before so the first couple of days there was a lot of images which um, were pretty easy to discard they were out of focus and blurred and not the right light but um, eventually I think as Trent said I got the concept of light I could see what the light meant um, and getting that right after about a week or so. But so it was a great learning experience. It was a huge curve for me to, to test myself. In a lot of ways, I felt a bit vulnerable in the first week because I knew I had to produce this top quality book, which was going to sell at a, a pretty decent price. And I couldn't put out an average product. So I really was out there on a bit of a limb, um, you know, making, you know, knowing that I had to produce this really good book. And uh, thankfully, I, I think I got it. Um, Part way through the journey and really enjoyed the experience and it was um yeah, it was one of the best couple of weeks of my life i think you definitely got it it seems inevitable to me in hindsight given your passion for india for cricket and photography it seems like a no-brainer that you would actually produce this book can you tell us a yeah, little well, bit about what you know got yeah. you over the line got you there yeah well i remember talking to you a few times about going i you know hoping to maybe go back to india with a a really good photographer and that was obviously yourself we talked about this concept a lot a lot of years ago but it obviously didn't align us doing it together but um i'd always um you know first time i went to india was 1986 and the famous tide test series and even back then i'd always take my canon camera with me and um and take a lot of shots i'd always sit at the front of the bus because i thought that's the best view and you you see what's going on outside where other, other guys would like playing cards or reading newspapers or whatever i was always sort of up towards the front looking outside and seeing what was going on and India really fascinated me. There was so much uh, to see, so many different scenes, scenarios, kids, children, women, you know, playing cricket, the girls and, down in the alleyways, um, in the beaches. Um, wherever you looked out the bus window, there seemed to be a game of cricket going on. But as a professional cricketer with a high profile, you, you couldn't get off the bus and take photos because you'd be swarmed within 10 seconds. It wasn't possible. So I'd always try to sneak out of the hotel and take shots of um, everyday life and people going about their business and, seeing things I'd never seen in Australia on the, on the on the streets of India. So in the back of my mind, one day I thought I'd love to go back to India when my profile's not quite as extreme as it was when I was playing, uh, take a small group of mates, get on a, a bus and just start driving to different places and stopping on the way. And if I saw a game of cricket, get out and take a photograph. So that's where the, the concept came from. Obviously, it took a bit more planning than that. There was stuff that we had to plan before I got to India because we had 17 days um, to try and put together a book. So there were certain things that were planned and then other times was ad lib and just as you saw something, we'd stop the bus and get off and we'd try and immerse ourselves in maybe a game of cricket on the side street or in the alleyway. And, um, you know, as I say, over 17 days, we had nine different cities, um, ended up taking about 20,000 photos. Um, so the hard part <laughs> of that was the selection process. You said uh, Trent thought you were crazy trying to do this in 17 days, yeah. and it, it's yeah. one of the first things that stands out. So I know I know you've mm. mentioned the numbers, but I'll mention them yeah. again. The book has 324 pages and 220 colour photographs, and it was mm. shot, thank you, Paramount, there's the book, yeah. shot over yeah. 17 days. Mm. And, yes, yeah. 
pretty crazy. I must admit, like, I'm always, um, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty ambitious. And I, I didn't know any better. That was the thing. Like, if, if I knew what I was doing, I, yeah, I would have said I'm mad. But I just thought, you know, let's let's create a book. And I've, I'm used to sort of, um, you know, throwing ideas at and just going for it and working out how to do it later on. And um, and when I first mentioned to Trent, you know, can you come on this journey with me? Seventy days. I want to take do this book, and I have three or four hundred photos. He thought. He, he, he thought I was dreaming. He basically said, it takes me 10 years to get 30 good photos and you want to get 317 days and you don't know what you're doing. I said, yeah, we'll be fine. Don't worry. Um, and, um, you know, he sort of, um, he got the concept and it wasn't, um, you know, as if I'm the world's best photographer, but I wanted to make, create good photos, good enough to put in a book. And, and he bought into that concept and he was an amazing teacher. And, um, you know, I just um, learned an incredible amount of, um, just standing beside him, you know, capturing the big moment first and being patient and wait. And a bit like a game of cricket, you know, you got to plan in your head, it's intuition, gut feeling, wait for the characters to come in out of the picture and then get the right moment where no, nobody else gets that moment. So that was the starting point. And then learning about light and, um, you know, all the different settings and, you know, just getting yourself in the right position for a photo was really important so learning for me. In, in the planning, what... Was there one thing that stands out that was like the most daunting aspect of it or did you just um, launch well, into it? And just... Everything. I think in India, everything is daunting, really. Um, you've got to go with the flow. And uh, I just said to the team that came with me, um, you know, we've got to have patience here and you can't be frustrated because India will test you out in all different ways, but it'll oh, work yeah. out eventually if you're patient. So just go with the flow and um, it'll happen. But we obviously had to plan certain things out, um, like road trips, um, you know, going to the Taj, um, you know, going to Durham, Shala and uh, and different places. We had to we had to plan ahead because um, a lot of organisation getting seven people through airports on buses and with all the camera gear, not easy That's to get through right. airports in India. Um, and so we we planned the trip, the, most of the flights at night time. So we're basically shooting from six in the morning to seven or eight at night every day. Um, I stayed at nine amazing hotels, but I can't remember any of them. And I and all we did was basically get the room key, have a shower, get a meal go to bed, wake up in the morning and move to the next place. Um, so it was just, um, yeah, I must admit, I, I, almost, I, I almost got myself in test match cricket mode where I was totally um, immersed in it and almost in this little bubble and nothing else sort of got in that bubble. It was just doing this job and I loved it and trying to take the best photos and trying to improve and trying to meet and see as many different things as I could in that short period of time. So you, you, you obviously covered quite a few locations. Yep. And, and it was an intense trip. And I'm sure mm. there's probably a few answers to this, but is uh, there one or two locations where you walked away thinking, I just need more time? I would uh, Well, we, we did it could, I just yeah, I, I think all of those, I could have spent at least a day at a lot of those places. And sometimes we had to move on. And, you know, Harley, my manager was there. He was sort of the timekeeper. And he said, come on, we're going to move on. I said, no, no, I'm not finished yet. I need another half an hour. And it was just, um, I could have stayed longer at much of those places. And yeah. um, the shot that you just held up before, the, the cover of the book, that was one where I needed more time. We, we had to make more time because um, it was in January um, 2020. And that time, the, we didn't realise, but um, a lot of time up, up north, uh, there's quite a bit of fog. So we set off from the hotel to go to Agra. It was a four and a five hour drive on the team bus got there and uh, it was covered in fog and we thought, okay, this surely is going to lift and we could maybe see the Taj because you couldn't even see the Taj. And um, we waited three or four hours and we could just make it through the fog. You could just see it. There was no good for any photos. And in my mind, when I had the idea of this book, I thought the cover shot's got to be you know, iconic, something iconic, which is a Taj. We've got to, play, got to have someone playing Krieg in front of the Taj for the cover shot. So we waited five hours, no shots, drove home. So a 10-hour round trip, and um, next day we're flying somewhere, I think just uh, mid-afternoon, the next day we're flying out of Delhi, and uh, thought, I've got to come back in the morning and try again. So next morning it was just um, Trent and myself. We hired a car ourselves and told the guy, get there as quick as you can. So that was an incentive to him, for him to turn into Lewis Hamilton and for four hours going to the Taj. So it was zigzagging in and out of traffic, and we should have made a documentary just on that trip. But I got there in record time, and then as we turned up the Tars, the weather was perfect and I got that cover shot and we spent a couple of hours there and we drove back another four and a half hours. So it was 18 hours to get that cover shot. Um, Fantastic. As, you know, as a photographer, you've got to sometimes have patience and you've got to persevere. And I knew I needed that shot and had, just had to make it happen. Yeah, fantastic. Shall we uh, look at some of the pictures? Yes, yeah. we'd love to. In fact, while you uh, share your screen, Richard, I just want to remind the audience, you know, this book, 
beautiful. Again, we're going to see some images, uh, select images here, but you can actually buy it exclusively from, you know, uh, Steve Waugh's website is stevewaugh.com.au. AU is for Australia, stevewaugh.com.au. And it's exclusively on the website. It's not, not on any, any other bookstore or Amazon. And he's even happy to sign it for your dedicate to someone in your life if that's what he would prefer. There's a way to kind of write it down. And he ships internationally. In fact, I got my book in record time, beautifully packaged, and I'm loving every second of it. So I'm still, I got to be honest, I'm still yeah. awestruck here seeing both of you on this frame. Uh, yeah, and and, and I, pack every, I pack every book as well. So um, it's self-published. So I'm sticky taping. Every tape on that package was done by myself. Um, and I got good at it because I've done about three or 4,000. Now, the first thousand, the packing wasn't very good, but we're pretty good at it now. <laughs> Now's the time to buy. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so one thing that stands out when you look through the book is the yeah. number of, I think you call them gully games or park Yeah, gully matches. cricket, yeah. Gully, gully cricket. cricket. It's, yes. uh, it stands out how many different locations cricket is played in India, and we've all seen it. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is a classic, I guess, uh, on the beach. Yeah. Yeah, and this was one of those things uh, in India, you've got to be prepared for the unexpected. And um, this wasn't actually in the itinerary. We, we'd just come from um, um, uh, the Dharavi, actually, in Mumbai, the Dharavi slum, and uh, I spent some time with um, some kids that I'd known from a previous program that I support through the Laureus World Sports Academy. And we are taking some shots there, and we went to, we're going to the airport in Mumbai, and uh, we had a couple of spare hours uh, for whatever reason. And I thought, let's just pull off and have a bite to eat because the schedule was pretty hectic at that stage. And... Um, we pulled into this, uh, like, a, I think it was a tennis sort of club and um, four or five stories up, they had a restaurant. So we're having a meal and uh, halfway through the meal, I thought I might as well have a look over the balcony and see what's happening. And there it was on Juhu Beach. There was all these games of cricket starting to develop um, in, in the afternoon um, whether people had just finished their work or not. But there were people, kids flying kites and, um, you know, uh, and people walking along just casually and all these games of sport were being played. And, uh and that was a shot I took from the balcony on about the fifth story, just looking down on the beach. And um, it was just incredible uh, to see so many people, so many games of cricket, but, um, you know, the colours of the sand and the colour of the water and the waves coming in, it was... Um, and just experimenting with different types of lenses, you know, and getting it nice and close and trying to capture the, um, uh, I guess, the, um, the, uh, the shadows of the people when they're playing. That was sort of what I was focusing on with the cricket shot, not only trying to get the bat in the shot on the bowler, but... Um, getting the shadows right. So that was, um, it was really great fun taking those photographs. Yeah, it's a great perspective. I think you then went down on the beach. Yeah, we did. I uh, thought we're going to bit more time. Let's get down amongst the action, which was great because there's so much going on down the beach and um, it was chaotic as India always is. And and this was a shot, um, obviously, just when the sun was going down and uh, I was with Trent Park and I was taking my shots and looking at them and thinking, oh, they're, they're really nice, not too bad, it's a nice shot. And then he said, you look, just change the shot of shutter speed and do a few little tweaks here and there. And all of a sudden it became a silhouette shot. And also to sort of exaggerate the scene was getting down, laying down flat on, on the sand just to get the angle right. And um, I was lucky enough for that shot to get the, the follow through right. And the ball is in the top left hand um, side of the shot as well. So uh, it was one of those, when you look back and I, I'm thinking I probably had 10, 20 shots before the sun went down and then, and I didn't see that till the next day when I looked back and checked over the shots. I thought, I hope I've got one where I've got everything in the frame and the ball in the shot. And thankfully, it was in, in the far left-hand corner. And it's a beautiful shot. It's a stunning shot. I, I got to say, just, uh, just two comments, if I may. I love the fact that you can actually see the ball in the frame uh, up in yeah. the air. And two, the silhouette has an amazing metaphorical hu uh, humanizing quality where it just equalizes everyone in the frame. You know, yeah, which yeah, is... Right. Yeah. It could be anyone playing cricket. That's the great thing about cricket and uh, what, what, what makes it such a fantastic game is it doesn't matter who you are, what background, what nationality, what, what skin colour, um, what demographic you're from. When you pick up a bat and a ball, everyone's equal. And in that shot, there could be anyone playing that shot. It could, could be Sachin Tendulkar, but it's, um, you know, it's just a, a young local boy having a, a, a game of cricket with his mates. Yeah, well said. That's it. I think, uh, Steve, at your exhibition, we had a chat about this, and I yeah. seem to recall it's one of your favourite pictures. Yeah, it is, because it was challenging to get that shot. Um, this was at a, an orphanage, um, and uh, we spent some time with the, the boys there, and they're really keen cricketers, um, obviously from a tough background, um, you know, challenging life experiences, and um, 
the instructions we have were, look, you can take group photos, but you can't take any individual shots because we don't want um, the, the children's faces being exposed. And, you know, what, for whatever reason, I didn't want them um, um, individual shots of the kids' faces. So I thought, right. I really want to get this young, young, quick bowl. He's only 14, 15 year old. He's about six foot tall, really long limbs. And he was just striving so hard to impress me. He was running as quick as he could and putting everything into his bowling action. Um, and obviously got together with Trent and I said, look, I want to really capture this guy. How can we sort of make sure the image is blurred? Because I want to capture that thought of him being quick and the energy through the shot. A bit like when you see, um, I guess, cycles on the velodrome where the blurred wheels. I wanted to see it blurred just to capture his energy and speed. And um, so, again, got down on the ground nice and low and I probably took 100 shots of him and his mates. But I wanted this particular young boy because he had the long long levers and I thought it would just exaggerate what he was doing. And um Obviously, you know, slowed the uh, the shutter speed down to sort of blur the image. And um, again, the benefit of um, photography these days um, is you can quickly see what you're doing through the through, through the viewfinder and just see if you're on the right direction. Whereas 30 years ago, when I was taking shots in India on slide film, you wouldn't see the results for two or three weeks. Here it's instant, instantaneous, and I sort of was getting on the right path. And then finally, this shot came along, which I thought captured. Um, just the enthusiasm, the energy, and um, the excitement of this young boy bowling quick. Yeah, it certainly does that. It's a great shot. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Steve. Uh, he was trying to impress you, and that uh, that brings up a question: Do you do you ever wonder, you know, how do you capture the moment without influencing the moment? Because you clearly are a celebrity, sports celebrity, in India. You know. Yeah. Well, that was a challenge in India because you know, uh, a lot of times the kids might not recognise me, but the people around, the parents or someone else would, and, and straight away they think, oh, you know, former Australian captain and Steve Waugh, they get really excited and and overdo things. And I'd often say, or well, I get through my security guard, who's a really nice guy, he'd speak to them maybe in the local language and he'd just say, look, um, just go about your normal business. He's, he's doing this book showcasing you know, trying to capture what is the spirit of cricket through India, through cricket, and um, he wants to feature you in the book. So just keep on doing what you're doing, and afterwards we'll have a game of cricket together. So that seemed to relax right. everyone. And they went back to being normal um, so I could get the, the natural shots, and then um, afterwards we'd have the game of cricket. So it kept everyone happy. That's amazing. That's, that's great. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. The names of Mumbai. Yeah. Um, and this was an effort um, on the first day we got there, or the first night actually, because um, we got to Mumbai, I think in the after lunch and got to the hotel and um, got all my camera gear out. And I was nervous because I wasn't sure whether I was good enough for the what I was trying to achieve. And um, so we went to the Oval Maidan in Mumbai, which is a vast expanse of land, but normally on a weekend or during the day, there's thousands of people playing cricket. But this was actually late at night, so... It's a bit tricky there because it was actually quite dark and obviously you want to let more light into that shot. But the thing was, I was walking around just, you know, practice, really practicing my different settings and having a, trying to learn as much as I could. And I saw this young person down the far end of the Oval Maid Anne, you know, practicing um, by themselves. I went down there and I was just fascinated by this person just continually hitting the ball off the cone, and much in the same way as I did when I was a young kid, you know, practicing my straight drive and, bending the knee and getting the head over the ball and following through. And um, little did I realise, though, this this was actually a 20-year-old girl. She's really tiny um, and she was wow. practising by herself. And I thought, how good is that? You know, this young 20-year-old girl practising cricket by herself with just one ball and a batting cone. And to me, that's the spirit of cricket because, you know, she had no one really to help her or she wasn't there to sort of any fame or adulation, but she just wanted to get better. So... I um, took it upon myself to give her a, a couple of tips, and one of those was to you know make sure you bend your front knee more, follow through, you know keep your head head sort of still, and and just commit to the shot, don't, and be nice and relaxed. And all of a sudden, she got it. She started playing these incredible cover drives, and she was so happy with herself. And um, so I managed to get obviously a shot of her in, in practicing by herself. And there was also a portrait photo, which I really enjoyed taking it, just a picture of her face smiling because um, you know initially she didn't know who I was, and then someone told her that you know, what my background was and her eyes lit straight up and she was just soaking up every word I said. So, um, yeah, that was, it was a nice moment. It's also great in the context of other shots you've got where the maiden is full of cricketers. That yeah. it's, it's almost a lonely moment, isn't it? 
Yeah, which is unusual over there because there's always yeah. you know there's just lots of things going on and it's chaotic and and you're normally fighting for a bit of space. But there she was, um, dedicated, and uh, I think it was about six thirty at night, um, just hitting you know shot after shot by herself. And you can see the ball in the the bottom right hand uh, corner of the shot and the, the bat cone where she's um you know just yep. practicing a straight drive. Yeah, beautiful. This is what I haven't yet photographed myself in India, the mm. bat and the ball factory, which uh, I'm not going to go to India again without doing that. I just yeah, well, this is actually not the bat. This is not the bat and ball factory, but it's um, you've got you're right. You've got to go to there. This was actually on the uh, Azad Maidan. So yeah, the well, Azad Maidan, well. <laughs> which a young girl was there, and this was the Azad Maidan. So and this was um, you know, a little um, little shop on the side of the the playing field where there's thousands of games going on, and obviously. When you're playing these games, sometimes your bat breaks or the handle's creaky or, you know, you get a crack in your bat. And this guy uh, was a family tradition. I think it was started by his father or grandfather. So they've been in this little shack for 40 years just fixing bats up on the side of the, the playing fields. And um, he had all these bats lined up and he was sort of twining the handles and gluing the gluing the handles and fixing up the cracks and sandpapering. He had all these tools there. And I just thought, you know, this is the spirit of cricket. It's not necessarily always about, you know, the superstars. It's more about the grassroots and the people involved in the game. And for this guy, it was his livelihood. He was, you know, making a few dollars, but, you know, he was providing a, a valuable service for, you know, players where their, where their bats um, seemed destined for the, the rubbish, rubbish tip and all of a sudden he could resurrect them and give it a new life. And um, he was really an artist at work. I watched him for an hour or so and took a lot of photos and, yeah, great care and dedication to, to making sure that every job he did was was a really good job. Oh, it's it's classic India, isn't it? Have, providing a service right on the spot, yeah. right where it's exactly. needed. And um, it's so interesting that this generational, you know, mm. it's uh, and and the light. I love this shot. It's probably one of my favorites. It's a, it, it's a beautiful yeah. image. It's a beautiful yeah, image. The light again, that was, uh, getting the light right because the first time I, I, I started. Again, this was early on in my trip, and I um, I took a lot of sh shots from the other side. And then Trent came over. He said, "No, no, just just come back a bit. And just have a look at the light. Tell me where the light is right, and where does it look best, and which is the best angle to take the shot." And that's when I sort of moved around and thought the light was much better on his face. So again, that was part of the learning experience. And um, but there was so much color, and there's interesting things around the shot. It's um, yeah. You know, so it's, sometimes it's a bit hard to focus and get the shot because there's so much going on, and you. You're so excited. You want to capture every moment. So I think that situation was about just taking a deep breath and um, and just relaxing and just working out where the where the best shot was. I, I love this image. You know, um, what I like about this as a photographer is again you're at eye level. You know, you're at eye, not looking from from up down. Yeah. And also the leading lines, the cricket bats. You know, going from that to the cricket bat in the hand that he's working on, his arms and legs. It's just all just very. Beautifully come together. Yeah, yeah, look, there's obviously a little bit of luck involved there, but yeah, the more I took, the more I sort of saw these things, uh, framing it right and getting uh, getting it in perspective. And um, But I did like getting it down at ground level with a lot of these people because then you sort of make a connection with the person. And I think that comes through in the photograph when you have a connection with the person you're taking a shot from. And he had the respect to me and I had his respect. And it was like, you know, just uh, keep on doing what you're doing and I'll I'll try and do you justice with the, the shot I take. Right. It's another plastic site. <laughs> yeah, well, this is um, yeah, this was uh, funny. Well, this was actually um, on the morning I talked about going back to the Taj. We were panicking. It was Trent myself, and um, we I think it was actually on the way back, and um, we went past uh, Gurgaon, which is a city that wasn't in India 20, 30 years ago. So if, um, there's Noida, Gurgaon, and Delhi, and um, this was a city that's come up from nothing. So in the background is. Well, in the foreground is what Gurgaon used to be. In the background is um, is what the city is like now. That's only come up in the last 15 years. And um, there was this game of cricket going on and uh, we pulled over suddenly because I thought, I've got to take a shot of that. Next minute, the cow came into the shot. And um, I thought, how Indian is this, a you know, sacred cow in the cricket field? But the problem was, by the time I got all my camera gear out of the back of the car, we stopped, the cow had moved on. I thought, well, I know I'm, all my shots will be authentic and, and not manipulate in any way, but I do need the cow to get back in the shot. So the, um, the, the security guard, um, Yash, was, was with us. And, um, and I said, mate, we've got um, quite a few pastries and cakes that the hotel gave us for the road trip. 
Why don't you get a couple of those cup, cupcakes out and try and entice a cow back out in the field? <laughs> so I must have been in this shot. I did try and I did. The, I had to get the prop into the, into the shot. So he walked out to the sort of um, the outfield and he, he gave the cow a bit of a cupcake. And he, I said, mate, get out of the shot. He's perfect. I'll take the shot now. And, and there I was framed, you know, right on, right on the money. The, uh, the bowler coming in to bowl the ball, the batsman about to play the shot and the cow in the centre of the pitch. So it was one of those moments I thought, I've just got to get this. And uh, I haven't got hours and hours to get it. So I'm going to have to entice the cow back out into the field. I, th- I think we'll let you off on that one. That's um, way more creative than photoshopping a cow in. Yeah, no, for sure, yeah. Well, he was there. But no, he, was, you know, he was obviously moving around a bit and I was in a hurry. I was, I was going to say, and I was going to say, um, as, a, as a cricketer, you're obviously creating moments. You're creating history, right? We have all mm. seen you play cricket. Um, and then as a photographer, you're capturing moments. But this the cow yeah. image was an exception where you're creating an image creating a moment and capturing it. I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, it was a bit of fun, yeah. And uh, here was a perfect example of um, what I wanted to do in this trip was to um, be impromptu and um, and improvise. And if I saw something happening on the side of the road, just pull over. And this was one of those moments where we were driving on the motorway um, or a freeway. And um, it was just a barren piece of ground. Um, these guys playing cricket, this, this incredible tree in the background. And um, I said, just pull over, pull over quickly. We pulled over on the side of the road, sort of dodged a bit of traffic and set myself up uh, basically behind the bowler's arm on a bit of a mound and um, and started taking photos of this game of cricket going on, which was just between some mates playing and it was very animated. And um, there's another shot in the book where there's, um, um, there's, a, there's a cart going through with a couple of um, cows pulling a cart through and people sitting on the back of the cart, which is very Indian as well. But it was just... Um, just the enthusiasm of these guys playing the game was, was the most important game of cricket they've ever played. Just judging by the way they were getting excited when they were hitting fours and sixes or when a wicket was taken, it was high fives everywhere. So I was sort of just engrossed um, just watching the game of cricket. It was like um, we snuck into their game and I didn't want to interrupt them. So I took, um, obviously got a longer lens out, um, 70, 200 mil lens and, um, and took these photos from the hill where they probably didn't even know we were watching the game. Uh, so I was going to ask you, so they, they weren't really aware? No, they weren't aware at all, no, no not at all. Um, so, yeah, I didn't even get, in fact, with that, we were in a bit of a um, time, we were time poor, so it was basically 15, 20 minutes, get as many shots as I can, back on the bus and uh, and away you go with these, that, these guys, even knowing we were there. Yeah. You know, uh, the tree is interesting, actually. It's a very, very peculiar tree. I just love the tree, uh, centres the whole yeah. image. And then yeah, these yeah, no, stuff, you know, just go ahead. Then that was key. I mean, again, Trent said, look, you just make sure the trees is a big part of the shot because it's pretty, it stands out and makes the photo different. So, again, if I was there by myself, maybe I'd take it from a different angle. But um, with Trent there sort of guiding me, it was, uh, was important to get the tree in the shot. And even uh, if you notice, the stumps are all kind of, I think they're made of bricks. They're not real stumps, yeah. if I can see it. And that just shows how resourceful yeah. people are for the passion of the game. Yeah, that's it. I mean, um, yeah, yeah. You're, I'm always amazed at uh, how they get the stumps, and they're always neatly. You know, this occasion was neatly stacked bricks, and um, yeah. So that's the great thing about India. You, know, you just need a bat and a ball, and then I think the quote I had at the start of the book was energy, enthusiasm, and imagination. That's all you need for a game of cricket, and that uh, pretty much sums up um, gully cricket in India. That they just find a way to have a game, and stumps are made out of um, you know, it could be tin cans or bricks or or backpacks or shoes. And away you go. And, there's, and there's, there's, there's always an audience too. There's people on the bicycle and the uh, two-wheelers yeah. sitting. Like no matter it's one Kere or Eden Garden, even yeah. here there's an audience. Yeah, that's right. Always. There's quite a few people on the, on the mound to the right of me as, as well. You're right. Um, just um, attracts people. The uh, the monks playing cricket up at, yeah. at Dharamsala, I assume. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, one of the highlights of the trip. Um and this was one where we had to sort of pre-arrange. You know, we, we knew we were going up to Durham, Shala. I wanted to capture the Women's Cricket Academy, which I did, which was fantastic. And But I wanted to have a game of cricket with um, with, with the local uh, monastery and uh, the monks. And so they were told, look, we're coming along. Let's have a game of cricket. And um, so this was a beautiful setting, um, obviously, in the mountains there. And the Dalai Lama lives not far from here. Um, so you couldn't get a better better setting for a game of cricket, and um, and these guys were, were very good cricketers. I mean, I've got some video of myself down there playing, but um, 
yeah, they were just uh, no fear and uh, they were playing on a literally a, a cow paddock. It was very up and down and there are cows in there again. And um, I thought they'd come along and they'd, they'd play with tennis balls. But again, because I was there, they were trying to impress me. So out came the brand new rock hard cricket balls. And the bowlers were running off their full runs. There was actually no protection on the batsman or the wicketkeeper. They were standing there and at, really at the mercy of the ball bouncing properly. And I, I saw that many times guys getting hit in the legs or the shins and the, and the ribs and and not even flinching. And then finally, uh, one, of the, one of the young guys was batting and um, he went to play a cover drive and the ball leapt off, off, off a length, like almost like a spitting cobra. And hit him straight in the cheekbone. I thought... He's got oh. a broken cheekbone or a broken jaw. He's going to fall down a heap and carried off in an ambulance to the hospital. And there he was. He did not even flinch. He didn't show any emotional pain whatsoever. And afterwards, I went up to him and I, I said, how's your sort of cheekbone? It was all sort of swollen and all the other guys were laughing. And they thought he was weak by you know, showing any sort of pain. So they were just so tough. And then all of a sudden, they wanted me to have a bat. And I'm thinking, how am I going to have a bat? I can see he's all like, well, that's, that's I'm going to get killed out here. But I had to show some sort of... Um, courage and conviction to get in there because they played against the cricket. So I batted for a little while against the cricket ball and backed away and hit a couple in the middle. But um, for these guys, again, it was a chance to show me how good they were. And um, and some of the guys could have actually played first-class cricket. There was one or two batsmen that I think could have could play first-class cricket. But again, it was a pretty surreal setting, you know, in front of the, you know, the Himalayan mountains of Durham Shire playing a game of cricket with the monks. I mean, that's something on the bucket list for most people. And for me, it was, was a great experience. I remember you telling me quite a few years ago, one of the early ideas for a book was you said you just wanted to go around photographing yep. cricket grounds in amazing locations. And this one certainly yeah. fits that bill. Yeah, and I'd like to do that. I mean, there's, there's so many um, grounds or places in the world around, you know, you know Nepal and, and other places and Bhutan and India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Well, there's these incredible grounds. Um, so, yeah, one day perhaps that's, that's another project I'd like to get involved with, but... It gave me a taste for it, you know, this spectacular location. Yeah. You know, uh, Richard and Steve, even this image, if you can go back for a second, the shadows so beautifully mm. mirror the mountains, the Himalayas. It's just uh, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. well, that's why you guys are good because I didn't see that. And we were standing on, um, actually, it was a person's balcony. Um, there was a house there. And, um, and Trent said, well, what do you think about those shadows? I said, oh, yeah, I don't really want them in the shot. He goes, no, 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 they're, they're perfect. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> he said, look, they mirror the shape of the mountains. So, again, my eye didn't see that initially. By the end of the trip, I was seeing these sort of things, but you can see why you guys are at a different level because you see things differently. But straight away, Trent was going, oh, look, the, the shadows are amazing. They, they mirror the you know, the same um, shape as a mountain. So I thought, yeah, they probably do. Um, so, again, it was Thankfully, a learning experience. Steve tested me on that at, at, at his exhibition. <laughs> he, he made a comment about the shadows <laughs> and I I had to think for a minute, but then I got the answer and he said... You got it, yeah. You passed. exactly right? what Trent said. <laughs> yeah, you passed. I, I got to say, Steve, Richard is a real deal. I just fake it till I make it, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think this is one of the most remarkable oh, stories in, of the project, Steve. Um, yeah. I, this is a great shot, but also in the video, some of the video mm. material you produced. The, yeah, the story, yeah. The story is amazing. Yeah. A real highlight... Um, and before this, again, we had to set a few things up to make sure we maximised our time. So literally 200 metres to the left of this, um, I was photographing this young boy, Shyam, who was um, seen as an expert at Coley. So an eight-year-old boy who practices 40 hours a week. So I spent two or three hours taking photographs of this young boy. So, And we took him out to the middle to take a couple of shots. And, um, and I'd almost forgotten that we had um, scheduled a couple of hours with these phys physically challenged cricketers. So whilst I was taking some shots of Shyam, near the centre of the pitch. So these guys were playing cricket and, um, and I, I sort of didn't notice. So I turned around and saw what was going on. I was totally blown away by these guys flying through the air like ninja warriors, landing on those pieces of bamboo. Uh, and on another occasion, uh, a guy had like a crutch under his arm and they were, they were just running in as quick as they could. Um, obviously, the, the bowler there's got polio, so his left leg is really no use to him at all. He's sort of, you know, and he's contorted in this incredible way, and he's using the, the, the pole as a brace. The batsman is also missing the lower part of his leg and, and has a, a crutch under his left arm. And But the standard of cricket was in, amazing. That was so good um, and so enthusiastic and so committed. And, um, you know, I was just um, taken away. And, again, Trent, 
Um, and you'll see in the book, there's some shots of the guys bowling by themselves and they're like flying through the air like ninja warriors. But to get down nice and low and to make sure there's some clearance um, with these bushes in the background, that these guys are like flying through the air. And um, But they're just so good. And I, I felt guilty because um, I kept sort of not quite getting the shot right. I said, can you come in again and leap as high as you could? So these guys were, again, giving 100% every time they came in. And by the end of the session, they were absolutely knackered. They, they, they couldn't bowl anymore or couldn't bat anymore. We'd sort of just totally drained them of all their energy. Mm. You know, this image, and I've seen the other images in the book, Steve, uh, I just love this image. And in fact, we put this on Instagram and this got uh, the most likes. Not that likes mean everything in the end. I yeah. want to be clear, yeah. but... And the reason why people love this image, and I'll tell you, uh, is because, yes, you could, exp you, you obviously have in your book um, mm. images of the cricket stars, Tendulkar, Kohli, and others, yeah. you know, and that's expected because, you, you know, you are in that league yourself. But very few people actually know how diverse the game is, you know, um, yeah. and how it's played by, in this case, physically challenged and what it actually means to them. So you're yeah, really yeah, beautiful. Yeah. After right, that. I mean, 100%. I mean, there's only two images of cricketers in the book, and that's one of Tendulkar and one of Dravid. And that was for that exact reason that this book wasn't about the superstars. This was about the grassroots and people out there who just love playing their game of cricket from whatever background. Um, you know, I had some photos of the um, the Blind Cricket Association in, in uh, Bangalore and then the Women's Cricket Academy up in uh, Durham, Charlotte, and the physically challenged cricketers. So um, it was back in the cross section of people. Who, you know, I took photos of a three year old boy who's a star on Instagram a hundred-year-old who was the oldest living first-class cricketer. So we tried to get um, a very diverse and cross-section of people that represented the game of cricket. And these guys um, were as committed as chess cricketers. Um, obviously, you don't get any money from playing, but they play with the same passion and same enthusiasm. Were, so, they, yeah. uh, were these boys interested in the photos you took? Did they want to see what you, you were doing? Or? Yeah. yeah, they definitely did. And straight away, I could show them. And, and we, we sent uh, a book over to the guys to look at and um, posted some images and got some feedback. So... They were really grateful for the um, actual promotion and letting people know that they exist because they obviously don't get much funding. Um, and that's the thing I find a little bit frustrating that, you know, that the professional cricketers out there making millions and millions of dollars and, and these guys are struggling to get, you know, any form of free kit or, or clothing or any sort of support. So I think by giving them a platform, at least it makes people aware that um, they're out there and hopefully they can get more support. Yes. Okay, so this is the bat and ball factory I have to go to. Yeah, yeah, that's the one you'd like, you'd love. I mean, and it was one of my favourite yeah. places to go to um, in my route. Um, and we spent four or five hours and I could have spent four or five days because it was a factory that was six floors high and each floor something different was going on. Now, down in the basement was basically where they were cutting the, um, the slabs of um, the bats, um, the, the um, English willow, you know, and sort of starting the shaping process and then the next level, they were sort of carving out the bats. Um, the next level was, you know, the gloves and the, and the pads and and then, um, you know, um, you know, doing the, the balls were towards the top. And this was on the top floor where they were, there was about eight guys hand-stitching balls. And uh, so they, they do this all day. And um, with this sort of archaic tools, um, they do eight balls per day. So they hand-stitch every stitch. And um, I was just mesmerised by how clever these guys were and the precision and the amount of effort and uh, pride they put into every ball they were producing. And, um, and what really got me with this photo was um, the guy who was doing it was about probably 70, 80 years of age. So I wanted to sort of capture his hand and, mm. and maybe you know, show how old he was and, but then also show his precision and skill. And um, yeah, it's one of my favourite photos. I've got quite a few of these um, of the hand around the ball and the guy stitching the ball. There's another one of the guy, you know, pulling the stitches through and, um, and it was just, um, it was mesmerising to watch them in, in, in work and, and how they did it. And um, as I say, eight balls a day, it takes a lot of concentration. And to me, again, it's the spirit of cricket because as a professional player, you take for granted where, you, where your pads and bats come from and where the balls come from. But when you see it first hand, you realise that they're putting just as much time and effort into getting it right as you getting your cover drive right or your outswinger right. It is a great shot. It really does tell the story you just told yeah. in words. Um, the, these balls, Steve, that are being handmade here, are what mm. level 
of competition are they used at? Do you know? Um, these ones are pretty good standard. They could be first class cricket. Um, they're not to the quality of probably the Duke or the Kookaburra or those sort of balls, but they're, they're, they're really good quality. So they could be used in first class cricket, probably Ramsey Trophy. Um, yep. And they're pretty expensive. So um, I think they're probably about $100 a ball, US, those ones. Right. Wow. Um, but yeah, as I say, it takes a lot of work in it and, um, and um, a lot of effort because you're only making quite a few in a day rather than churning them out by the, by the thousands. This is eight balls a day per person. Yeah. It's a beautiful shot. Love the colour. You know, I'm glad you weren't rushed. Well, you probably were rushed. You said you could have spent four or five days, but four or five yeah. hours. That, yeah, and, and actually the good part about this was um, I used a different lens because I took a lot of lenses with me and because um, Canon were a great supporter of this project. So I thought I'd take all these lenses. I'm not sure whether I'm going to use them, but Trent's advice was good that, you know, 24 to 70 mil is going to be 80% of your shots, um, the longer lens for some of the other stuff. And you may use a fish eye, but probably not. And I took also this macro lens, and that's the first time I used it, where you can this get it really macro. close. And you can see the detail, and I'm glad I use that lens, and I'll probably use it yeah. a bit more next time, but um, that's yeah. the only time I use it. But um, it, it really does um, almost exaggerate you know, what you see in the picture. It's beautiful. Uh, there are a couple of uh, non-cricketing shots yeah. in the book. Uh, this, this is one of them, and there's a portrait coming up. Yeah, well, uh, you're right in saying they're non-cricket shots, but they're actually cricket-related because it's part of my journey as well. In 1986, um, when we first we first went to India, we were learning about what it meant to play in India and the experience. And, you know, we had the siege mentality where a lot of times we didn't want to go to the subcontinent back in those years and we thought it's going to be terrible, nothing to do, it's going to be boring. I tried to break down that um, that scenario by getting out the streets and taking photos of myself. And on 86 tour, I, I actually asked the local person at the hotel, you know, where can we go to sort of get a real taste of India? He said, I'll go to the Dovey Gap. It's really colourful and it's lots going on and you'll love it. So every tour I went on back to India or Mumbai, I'd always go to the Dovey Gap and take some photographs. So to me, part of it is sort of the spirit of cricket because it started my journey playing cricket right. in India. So I wanted to go back there again. And here was this young boy, Mohammed, 16-year-old boy, uh, earning six US dollars a day, um, probably working 10 hours a day, you know, washing clothes and he was sort of smashing these clothes on these big um, stone blocks and there was water flying up everywhere. And his little house was um, in the foreground, actually. And there was um, six people in his family living in a room about three metres by four metres. And um, they lived there and they worked there. And here he was, this incredible smile. And um, with all the washing, he just, um, he just washed and uh, he was very proud of it. And I wanted to capture him and his, um, you know, where he was most comfortable. But obviously it's a tough life. Um, but this kid had a lot of spirit about him, and I wanted to sort of get that in the photograph. Yeah, yeah, I've I've spent a fair bit of time here myself. It, it's one of the most remarkable. Mm. It is, it is, to yeah. In India. Me too. Sure. I I try to go to Dhobi Gaut every time I go to Mumbai. It's just a magical place. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fascinating for sure. Here she is the lady in the market. Yeah. Did look, you get much um, time to? to to, to wander the markets and the streets generally? Um, yeah, a bit. Yeah, look, um, this was in Jodhpur, and um, I, I love going to markets. Well, I always love going there because you just don't know what you're going to get. There's so much going on. It was almost, you need about four or five cameras going at once. There's so much action. Um, but, again, this this uh, young lady, and she had two children with her. Um, straight away, it was, you know, it's a sort of famous National Geographic shot where the you know the, the eyes come through, and I thought I wanted to get one of those shots if I can of someone's personality or their eyes, or there's something about this this young lady. And then um, and I went up and started taking photos, and she was pretty shy and embarrassed, and looked away, and then eventually sort of made a connection with her, and we had a bit of a laugh, and then um, I took quite a few portrait photos of her. So I'm really happy with the end result. It was um, something I enjoyed was taking the portrait photos. And that, I never thought that would be part of what I was doing, but I ended up taking. Um, a lot of uh, people on the streets and just trying to capture their personality in uh, in a couple of minutes we spent together. So yep. yeah, you can see from this, she's shy, but she was also happy could, that I was taking a photograph as well. Did yeah. she know who you are, Steve? Um, no, she didn't start with, but I think she did by the end of it. You know, people were sort of telling <laughs> her and, um, you know, because initially she's saying, who's this bloke trying to take a photo and another tourist and, um, 
But yeah, they were, they were always friendly. I mean, I never had um, any resistance. And um, I think people know when you're sort of genuine, you're not trying to take advantage of them. And this was, you know, and then you'd buy something off. Um, they were selling knickknacks on the side of the road here. And uh, I, I bought a few things there as well. So it's sort of a bit of give and take. Do you, do you, have you, have you um, learned any Indian words or how do you approach them? Or is it you or your manager talks to them if you want to, you know, see if they're okay? No, no, it's always me. I, I always do. My, it's generally um, just by body language and gestures. And um, yeah, it, it's amazing enough, you know, in India, most people speak English. Um, yeah. But always, you know, namaste or namaskar, just to say hello and break the ice and, you know, danyavad or thank you. And, um, you know, Jolie, come on, let's go. You know, they're just a few little words you've learned playing cricket. It only takes one or two words and all of a sudden you break down the barriers. But it's more about, um, I think, the vibes you give off and the, and, the, and the positivity are probably more important than the words. I think it's your body language that's important. Yeah, yeah I agree, totally. This, this has got to be one of the great cricket pitches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's sort of again. Um, you know, I wanted to go out to the desert and capture something in the desert, and you obviously need a bit of help. And um, you know, the, the locals coming together for a game of cricket. This was in um, the Ossian Desert in you know, Rajasthan. And They'd have to be rolling ball. full tosses, wouldn't they, Steve? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because the ball it was pretty firm sand, so they were actually bouncing. But really? um, you're right. Yeah, it was a couple of tennis balls there, but it was freezing cold morning. And there was a mist in the background, and and um, again. Uh, Obviously, Trent was helping setting up that photo because there was a million different angles you could take it from. And um, I guess the key was to try and capture the motion of someone. I think the young boy in the in the front of the shot, you know, jumping through the air almost like a ballerina sort of makes this photo. Mm. It's sort of the, the action of him trying to get to his crease before he gets run out. And then obviously you've got the camels in the background and the other kids playing cricket and, and the lone sort of tree in the middle. It just, um, to me, just... Um, symbolises you know, cricket in India where you can play in any, in any situation. There's not many times you can see a game of cricket happening in the desert. And uh, Rajasthan's an amazing place. The colours and the landscapes and, and the people are really friendly. So, um, But it was challenging getting that shot because it was, was pretty cold that morning and there's a lot of different options to take shots and to try and get the right angle and get the light right. So I have to ask, did the security guard have anything to do with the camels? No, mate, they just wandered straight out of the desert. I can't believe my luck on that occasion. Wow. It's one of those things where you're there and, oh, there's three camels just coming in the background. So, yeah, you know, sometimes yeah. you get lucky. You are yeah. one lucky guy, I'm telling you, man. Oh, like, yeah. As Gary plays, you know, yeah. more, more you practice, the luckier you get. Yeah, that's true. That's well said. <laughs> now, exactly. And, and, and Richard, your question is sounds naive, but actually it's a really good question. Is I would not have assumed the ball actually bounces. And I thought, it's not, I mean, why would, it, why would you ever play cricket? In the desert, but there you go, you know. Yeah, a lot of full toss, but yeah, they did actually bounce with the tennis ball. So um, yeah, it was pretty pretty firm down there in that in the spot they picked. Yeah, it's Plus like that, it's, it's like a natural stadium. It is. Yeah, yeah, it was. It's and, and it's funny enough. I mean, this shot one recently uh, was named Wisdom Photo of the Year, which I was pretty excited about because it was up against some professional photographers. That was a pretty prestigious award to win. So I was, um, you yeah, know, sometimes uh, and it's funny, you know, because. This shot straight away when Trent already said, this is your shot, this is a great shot. And then when I had the exhibition in Sydney, a um, good mate of mine, Russell Crowe, came past and I invited him to come in and have a look. And he goes, oh, mate, that shot is perfect. It's framed. Everything's happening. I want that photo. So I gave him that photo. And that's funny how some people can see it straight away. For me, it was, oh, yeah, that's a good shot. But then the more I looked at it, I realised that everything sort of happened at the right time. It is, a, it is a really powerful shot. In fact, you mentioned the ballerina pose of the batsman. You know, that's... Mm -hmm. Uh, often called kind of the decisive moment, you know. Uh, it was a term coined by Henry Cartier Bresson, who started Magnum. Yep. So it's a beautiful shot. And again, you have yeah. a have an audience here, and the audience is the camels. Yeah, and, and a good <laughs> advice Trent gave me at the start of the trip too was that even if you're a long way away, um, the little things will show up when um, you have the photos sort of magnified and blown up. So he said, just get the, the angle of the bat right or the the person in motion, their legs right or their arms right, he said, even though you don't think it's going to show up, when you blow the photo up, all the little things will be magnified and, uh, and they'll make a difference. So, uh, again, that was, was good advice to get. Yeah. This is the uh, the last shot where which Trent obviously took. Yeah, yeah, and this was... Um, yeah, it was actually outside of Castle in, in Vedadora where um, it's the biggest... Um, um, 
it's a, the Rajasthan there. With, so the Raj of Vedadora, um, the Maharaja, sorry, had this amazing palace and it was actually bigger than Buckingham Palace. It's um, three times the size of Buckingham Palace and just in his grounds um, literally had a golf course and all these cricket uh, fields and um, and all the kids were there practising uh, during this particular afternoon. There was probably 100 kids and I thought what better that to sum up the spirit of cricket is kids, you know, enjoying themselves and on their starting out in their journey and we this old guy sort of been there and done it just in amongst them. So to me, that sort of summed up what is the spirit of cricket is kids enjoying themselves, mateship, um, having a good time and, and and learning life lessons along the way. Yeah, it's a great shot. Is this the palace where you had a game in the ballroom? Yes, yeah. Uh, it yes. sounded was, awfully risky because those ballrooms yeah. <laughs> are full of art and priceless antiques. Well, they and were. And, um, it's funny because... Yeah, it's a long story because that's, it was actually uh, back in those days called Baroda. And uh, in 1986, we played a tour game where these kids were. There's a ground and we played a tour game for the Australia, Australia versus, um, it must have been Baroda in the lead up to one of the test matches. And I got out, for, I remember I got out for 87 with 10 minutes to go on the second night of a three day game. And I got a really bad decision. So it had eaten away at me for like 30 years. And I got back to this ground and the memories came flooding back. Um, <laughs> it was just coincidence that, um, and the, and the, Maharaja, it was his uncle that actually hosted us during that match. So all these incredible stories sort of come together when you're in India. And then um, in the palace, I, I took a photo of the palace, which is beautiful, but I thought I need something more for the Spirit of Cricket book. So I went out, out in the limb of it and I said, oh, when's the last time we had a game of cricket? Because the Maharaja had actually played first-class cricket. And he said, the last time I played in the palace was when I was sort of 15 years old and we used to get a bat and a ball and play in the hallways. I said, well, how about we get a bat and a ball and let's have a game? And something must have tweaked in him straight away. He said, oh, yeah, that's great. Let, let's have a game. So he summoned up a bat and a ball and he went to the, the main dining room and uh, in there was uh, these incredible um, big paintings on the walls of all his relatives and these chandeliers and there's Ming vases behind us. And <laughs> so the setting for the game was, was pretty unique and his wife was panicking because the ball was flying around and bouncing off paintings and bouncing off these vases. But um, again, it was you know, India, a once in a lifetime experience that just sort of happened on, on the spur of the moment. Fantastic. Uh, you've, you've given uh, Trent lots of credit um, for working with you in terms of capturing the images. Did, did he play a part in the editing? Because, you know, you said you took thousands of pictures yeah. and it's a massive job for a photographer at any time. It is, yeah. And were I didn't realise uh, that. that were was you all, left your own devices because you took so many pictures? Yeah, and that was again a huge learning curve. Because I just thought you've taken the photos, they're, they're there, and that's that's what's going to happen. That's that's uh, the photos for the book, um, and that yeah, obviously it's not the case. I mean, you've got to go through them, start with. Um, so I spent yeah. you know, initially probably three days sitting alongside um, someone at Sun Studios who was involved with Canon, and um, we went through the eighteen thousand photos and got them down to probably a thousand after twenty or thirty hours. Um, getting them down from a thousand to two hundred or three hundred was was pretty much torturous, particularly the last hundred or so you've got to let go because you feel as if you're letting go of something that's, it's almost like it's one of your kids. You, you don't want to let go of anything. You want to keep them all there. And and I needed, I, I did need a lot of help to sort of to finalise the last shots. And even now, some shots um, that didn't make the cut of the book, I'd probably think maybe I should have put that in the book and maybe some of the shots in the book shouldn't be there. But So you're always sort of going through that. But it's a bit like I've written quite a few books. Some At some stage, you've just got to say, okay, that's it and let go. I think that process, that selection process, for me, I asked you this a question earlier about what was most daunting. Yeah. I would, looking at your project, think that the most daunting part of it for me would be that editing, editing process. And not, yeah. not just because of the, you know, the, phys, the time yeah. it takes and the decision making, but because you did it so quickly. And yeah. you, know, you, you did it so close to the capture and one of the things that so many photographers have said during um, this sort of forced lockdown that we've been in over the last year or so is that we've all gone yeah. back to our archives and we've yeah. nearly all found pictures yeah. that should have been <laughs> published it's years not. ago but weren't. Yeah. And I reckon it's just one of those things, you need space between taking and selecting yeah. and you didn't have that. Yeah, so, no, I totally agree with that because you know, I look at some of the shots now. I go, "Geez, oh, that's a really good shot." I mean, even the other day, um, you know, someone uh, bought one of my um, and all these shots are available for prints as well. If you, anyone wants to, to turn them into prints, because they do look pretty good in the boardrooms. But a, a mate of mine 
wanted one of the shots of um, the Taj and he didn't go for the cover shot, but he went for a shot inside the book where there's a, you'll see there's a kid playing a really awkward shot and he got in a really strange position. So it was a terrible cricket shot, but it actually makes this amazing photograph. And I hadn't seen it that way until I saw it blown up. So you're right. The more time you have looking at it and you think, okay, maybe that's more of a, a really good photo. So, um, yeah, it was difficult. Um, I needed people to help me. In the end, I just had to let go. And obviously the editing process, Trent helped me out with that. And there was some of the Sun Studios because, you know, the end product is a lot different to, you know, with the raw images, the stuff you got to do on every image. And I didn't realise that. So, um, again, that was, was part of the learning curve. Yeah, absolutely. I had a couple of questions. Uh, so I don't know, Richard, if you want to uh, stop sharing so we can get you all on full screen. Yeah. But, uh, and before I ask the questions, I do want to remind everyone, do check out uh, the book on mm -hmm. TWA's website. It's twa.com.au. And as I said in the beginning, just beautiful images. We just saw a small sample of it, just really diverse and really interesting images. And uh, he is going to... You know, hand sign if you would like him to dedicate to whoever you mm -hmm. want in your life. And it's exclusively from his website. It's not on any bookstore or Amazon. And it does ship internationally. In fact, I got mine. And it was just shipped beautifully. And as he just said, he packs it himself. So he's become mm -hmm. a professional packager guy too. Mm -hmm. Not just to pick it around and put it So that's, that's a bonus. Uh, as we wrap this up, um, question for you, uh, Steve. Um, some of us know you also do a lot of philanthropy. And both in India and also in Australia. Tell us a little, little bit about that. Yeah, well, I guess that came via cricket as well. And being in India um, in the mid-90s, um, we'd lost a test match in Calcutta in four days and I was pretty disappointed about that. And I had this handwritten note put on my door from a lady from the Calcutta Foundation, a lady called Shamlu Dadeja. And she said, can you please come out to um, this rehabilitation centre called Udayan? I need um, someone to give them profile. They're running out of money and they do the this great work by giving kids a life, um, a way out of their leprosy colonies. And um, so I took on the day off, I decided to go out there and um, gave profile and recognition to this cause, raise money. Um, and that was the day and that was 20 odd years ago. And from that, I realized I could, I could raise awareness. I could increase the profile. I could also raise money. So I started my own charity in Australia called the Steve Wall Foundation, which looks after kids with rare diseases. And we've been going 17 years now. And, um, and that's a huge part of my life. And, my wife and myself dedicate you know, 20, 30, 40 hours a week. We have done that for the last you know, 15 to 17 years. And, um, and we get great satisfaction out of changing kids' lives. Um, so I, I guess I've got India to thank for not only a lot of great cricketing moments, but also some life-changing moments where I met Mother Teresa and, and started my charity work. Wow, it's amazing. Was there anything, um, Steve, you learned in your journey in photography that you learned about yourself that surprised you, that you don't know about? Um, that's a good question. Um, look, I, I, I learned to, that I really, I do love photography and I, I love seeing interesting things and meet interesting people. And I just like the human spirit. And that's the great thing that attracts me to India is, um, no matter where you're from or what your background is or how much money you got, when they got on the cricket field, it was like, they had this amazing passion for the game. It's something that, that binds India together and they feel proud about their country when they play cricket. So, um, yeah, that fascinated me, but I think every country has got a, sort of different spirit to the cricket like Australia I want to do a photography book in Australia and go to, back to Outback Australia and capture what is the Aussie way of playing cricket what, what does cricket mean to Australians I think maybe different in the Caribbean and different in England so you know if I can get funding because obviously putting a book together like this is not easy you need a lot of funding and Canon thankfully funded this one but going forward I, obviously I'd like to do again because um, you know I found it totally interesting it was a great time with five or six of my close mates it was like almost being back on a cricket tour in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned through uh, doing this that uh, anything is possible because I, I would never imagine I could produce a quality book, a, a book of this quality um, 10 years ago. So if you get the right people around you and your passion and you want to learn, I think I proved to myself that um, you know, most things are possible if you commit to it 100%. It's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. And then Thank one you. final question, and I'm going to, you know, have Richard after my final question, if you would like to close it, any comments from you, and then we can close. But, you know, you spent, a, a, you know, obviously your innings, number one of your career on cricket, and that was, like I said earlier, creating moments. Now you're capturing moments. Have you kind of realized the paradox of the two? And uh, does that occur to you? It's just an interesting journey of your life. Yeah, look, I've... 
I guess creating moments was something I did naturally because you know I was good at cricket and I didn't think about it. It was just um, it was part of what I did and I enjoyed it. And you look back and you realise you're part of history. Um, yeah, now I'm on the other side. I want to sort of capture what's going on out there, and um, I'm sort of the flip side. I can relax more, and I'm not under pressure. I can just see and go out and, and take the photos I wanted to take. So for me, it was um, you know one moment you're sort of creating history a bit. Next minute you're capturing it. So um, I like being out of the limelight. So I'm, I'm happy being a photographer behind the camera, and you know it's a it's a position I'm pretty comfortable with. It's wonderful, Richard. Any last comments? Yeah, no, thank you, Steve. I think it is pretty interesting. It's, how, how long since you um, stopped playing? 15 years or so? Uh, 17 it's taken, years now, yeah. It's 17? Pretty, it's, yeah. it's taken 17 years for you to be able to walk the streets of India yeah. <laughs> sort of on your sort own, of. sort of, but still with a yeah. security guard. Yeah. And yeah. That, that alone just shows the passion that the, the Indian yeah. population has for cricket. And, and, you know, they do love the Australian team. Um, anyone yeah. who's travelled yeah. through India will have the names of the captains reeled off oh, yeah. at them on an almost daily basis. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you got there. It's a fantastic effort to produce this book. And um, yeah. I think we should just say thank you from Paramount and I for joining us. It's oh, been a pleasure. It's been I really a enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks for being the uh, inspiration in a lot of ways behind it, Richard. It was um our conversation many years ago that sort of um, gave me the idea that maybe I'd like to go back and, and do this project. I'm glad I did it. It was great fun. Great. Nice someday to see you. Let's, go, to let's yes. go travel to India together someday. It'd be good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Nice see you.